Chapter four, section three. How does private property affect individualism? Private property is usually associated by so-called anarcho-capitalism uh, with individualism. Usually private property is seen as the key way of ensuring individualism and individual freedom, and that private property is the expression of individualism. Therefore, it's useful to indicate how private property can have a serious impact on individualism. Usually, right libertarians contrast the joys of individualism with the evils of collectivism, in which the individual is submerged into the group or collective and is made to work for the benefit of the group. See Ayn Rand's book or books or essays on the evils of collectivism. But what is ironic is that right libertarian ideology creates a view of industry which would, perhaps, shame even the most diehard fam- fan of Stalin. Well, what do you mean by that? Simply that right libertarians stress the abilities of the people at the top of the company, the owner, the entrepreneur, and tend to ignore the very real subordination of those lower down the hierarchy. See, again, any Ayn Rand book on the worship of business leaders. In the Austrian School of Economics, for example, the entrepreneur is considered the driving force of the market process and tends to abstract away from the organizations they govern. This approach is usually followed by right libertarians. Often you get the impression that the accomplishments of a firm are the personal triumphs of the capitalists, as though their subordinates are merely tools, not unlike the machines on which they labor. We should, of course, interpret this to mean that right libertarians uh, – we should not, of course, interpret this to mean that right libertarians believe that entrepreneurs run their companies single-handedly, although admittedly you do get that impression sometimes. But these abstractions help hide the fact that the economy is overwhelmingly interdependent and organized hierarchically within industry. Even in their primary role as organizers, entrepreneurs depend on the group. A company president can only issue general guidelines to their manager, who must inevitably organize and direct much of their department on their own. The larger a company gets, the less personal and direct control an entrepreneur has over it. They have to delegate out an increasing share of authority and responsibility and is more dependent than ever on others to help them run things, investigate conditions, inform policy, and make recommendations. Moreover, the authority structures are from the top down. Indeed, the firm is essentially a command economy with all members part of a collective working on a common plan to achieve a common goal. It is essentially collectivist in nature, which means it's not too unsurprising that Lenin argued that state socialism could be considered as one big firm or office and why the system he built on that model was, well, so horrific. So the firm, the key component of the capitalist economy, is marked by a distinct lack of individualism, a lack usually ignored by right libertarians or at best considered as unavoidable. As these firms are hierarchical structures and workers are paid to obey, it does make some sense in a capitalist environment to assume that the entrepreneur is the main actor. But as an individualistic model of activity, it fails totally. Perhaps it would not be unfair to say that capitalist individualism celebrates the entrepreneur because this reflects a hierarchical system in which for the one to flourish, the many must obey. See chapter one, section one on this. Capitalist individualism does not recognize the power structures that exist within capitalism and how they affect individuals. In Brian Morris's words, what they fail, quote, to recognize is that most productive relations under capitalism allow little scope for creativity and self-expression on the part of workers. That such relations uh, relationships are not equitable, nor are they freely engaged in for the mutual benefit of both parties, for workers have no control over the production process or over the product of their labor. Rand, like other right libertarians, misleadingly equates trade, artistic production, and wage slavery. But wage slavery is quite different from the trade principle, as it's a form of exploitation. See Ecology and Anarchism, page 190. He notes that, quote, so-called trade relations involving human labor are contrary to the egoist values Rand and other capitalist individualist espouses. They involve little in the way of independence, freedom, integrity, or justice. See page 191 for that quotation. Moreover, capitalist individualism actually supports 
authority and hierarchy. As Joshua Chen and Joel Rogers points out, quote, the achievement of short run material satisfaction often makes it irrational from an individualist perspective to engage in more radical struggle since that struggle is by definition against those institutions which provide one's current gain. In other words, to rise up the company structure to better oneself or even get a good reference, you cannot be a pain in the side of management. Obedient workers do well. Rebellious workers do not. Thus, the hierarchical structures that help develop an individualist perspective, which actually reinforces those authority structures. This is uh, Cohn and Rogers notes, means that the structures in which workers find themselves yields less than optimal social results from their isolated but economically rational decisions. Steve Biko, a black activist murdered by the South African police in the 1970s, argued that the most potent weapon of the oppressor is the mind of the oppressed. And this is something capitalists have long recognized. Their investment in public relations and education programs for their employees shows this clearly, as does the hierarchical nature of the firm. By having a ladder to climb, the firm rewards obedience and penalizes rebellion. This aims at creating a mindset which views hierarchy as good and so helps produce more servile people. This is why anarchists would agree with Alfie Cohn when he argues that the individualist worldview is a profoundly conservative doctrine. It inherently stifles change. So what is the best way for a boss to maintain their power? create a hierarchical workplace and encourage capitalist individualism as capitalist individualism actually works against attempts to increase freedom from hierarchy. Needless to say, such a technique cannot work forever. Hierarchy uh, also encourages revolt, but such divide and conquer tactics can be very effective for a time. And as anarchist author Michael Moorcock put it, Rugged individualism also goes hand in hand with a strong faith in paternalism, albeit a tolerant and somewhat distant paternalism. And many otherwise sharp-witted libertarians uh, libertarians seem to see nothing in the morality of a John Wayne Western to conflict with their views. Heinlein's paternalism is at the heart is at the heart the same as Wayne's. To be an anarchist surely is to reject authority, but to accept, uh, to accept self-discipline and community responsibility. To be a rugged individualist a la Heinlein and others is to be forever a child who must obey, charm, and cajole to be tolerated by some benign, omniscient father. Rooster Cogburn shuffling his feet in front of a judge he respects for his office, but not necessarily himself in true grit. One last thing. Don't be fooled into thinking that individualism or concern about individuality, not, uh, uh, not quite the same thing, is restricted to the right. They're not. For example, the individualist theory of society might be advanced in a capitalist or an anti-capitalist form. The theory is developed by critics of capitalism such as Hodgkins and the anarchist Tucker saw ownership of capital by a few as an obstacle to genuine individualism. And the individualist ideal was realizable only through the free association of laborers, Hodgkins in that case, or independent proprietorship, Tucker in that. The reason why social anarchists oppose capitalism is that it creates false individualism. An abstract one which crushes the individuality of the many and justifies and supports hierarchical and authoritarian social relations. In Kropotkin's words, what has been called individualism up until now has only been a foolish egoism which belittles the individual. It did not lead to what it established as a goal. That is complete, broad, and most perfectly attainable development of individuality. The new individualism desired by Kropotkin will not consist in the oppression of one's neighbor as this reduced the individualist to the level of an animal. 